Hey everyone, welcome to the Dare to Care podcast, the podcast where we talk about the inner workings of ministry at Inspire Family Fellowship and community stories within the church. If you have comments, stories, or questions about Inspire or our Dare to Care ministries at any point during our podcast today, feel free to send those questions to carol at carol at inspirefamily.org. That's carol with an E. We also invite you to join us in person at Inspire any Sunday or Wednesday that you're able, 523 North 21st Street, Bismarck, North Dakota. We have Sunday services at 915 and 1045 and Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. My name is Ty Farnsworth. I'm the worship coordinator at Inspire Family Fellowship. I'm joined today by our Dare to Care coordinator, Carol Johnner, and our pastor in training, Rob Pesky. On today's episode, we're going to hear from Pastor Rob, his story, how he's been cared for, how he's cared for others, and what Dare to Care means in his life and his current journey as a pastor in training. So, Rob, to start, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, my name is Rob Pesky. I'm 5'11". I like long walks on the beach. Are you very pesky? (laughs) <laughs> That's a joke I've never heard before. Can they see the sarcasm on my face on the podcast? I sure hope so. Yeah. Once we start filming these, then they really will. Oh, yeah. Uh, no, I am a, I'm a Bismarck native, born here, raised here, went to college here, got married here. Like, I joke sometimes that I've had the same zip code my entire life. Um, but I was born and raised in Bismarck by parents who still love me and care for me. Um, I went to college and University of Mary and majored in music education and performance. I'm actually a drummer disguised as a pastor now and uh, spent years as a teacher. Um, After our first child was born, I quit full-time teaching to be a stay-at-home dad and did that for years while I also was kind of doing part-time teaching work on the side, um, either through different schools. I taught at BSC for a while. As my kids got older, um, I worked my work increased because they were off to school, and I worked at a church here in town for a while as the worship coordinator. I eventually quit doing that and went back to teaching full-time, eventually quit that, and I found myself here about a year ago working full-time, well, teaching, but in a different way, uh, as a full-time pastor, um, pastor in training, and so as part of that, I'm also enrolled in seminary. I go to uh, Kairos is what it's called, um, but it's based out of Sioux Falls, and I'm in the Luther House. I always tell people it's kind of Harry Potter-ish. The seminary has all these different houses for the different denominations, and so I'm in the Lutheran House of Study and uh, learning a lot there almost every single day and uh, being challenged in my faith and growing as fast as I can into a full-fledged pastor not in training. Although the longer I do this, the more I think I'm going to keep the in-training title as long as possible. Because then you can mess up and it's like, okay, he's in training. I'm still in training. training, So if anyone out there listening wants to add in-training to their title, it's probably a good idea. Because we're all figuring this out. I was going to say, I've been in training for 25 years. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Still figuring it out. Never will. At least. So yeah, so that's that's my uh, 32nd version of my story. But uh, I guess I... um, if I want to get more detailed, I am very lucky that I have lived, my parents were good Christian folks. They brought me to church every Sunday that I can remember. Um, and I grew up in the church. In fact, um, growing up in middle school, I had this crazy youth pastor named Randy Upgren. Um, and, uh, if that name is familiar to anybody, he's the head pastor here at Inspire. But really, um, he challenged me a lot, as as well as other people. I, I remember some other friends in middle school and high school that really challenged me. You know, if I were going to say I'm a Christian, I couldn't just say that because my parents took me to church every week. Like, you know, growing up, I had the faith of my parents because that's what you do. You go to church with your parents if they make you. Um, but somewhere in middle school, high school era, uh, Pastor, now Pastor Randy, um, got involved in my life and some other good friends got involved in my life and, and basically said, hey, you can't just pretend to be a Christian anymore or just be a Christian on Sundays. Um, if you're going to claim this uh, title, you're going to have to actually figure out what you believe and you got to live like you believe it. And uh, and so that was really good for me. Um, I uh, really got serious. There was an event in Bismarck uh, back in the 90s called The Fire. And I think it went into the 2000s, but I kind of aged out. But it was a community worship program. I think, was Pastor Ernie part of that too? Yep, he was, and Pastor Randy, and a bunch of other people. Um, but I remember being at some production at Century High School, and uh, I don't know what it was, and all of a sudden, er- no, Randy came running in and tapped me on the shoulder and says, hey, 
I need you to come with me. I'm like, oh, no, what happened? Well, he needed a drummer because <laughs> the fire was the next night and I played the drums. And uh, that was a really shaping thing for me, those worship experiences where you could really feel the presence of God in the room. And uh, so I started drumming for the fire, and those were some of my best memories. So your connection kind of changed a little bit. You were like part of the youth group stuff, and then now all of a sudden you're on stage. Yeah. And your connection then with other people on stage was different. It was. Yeah, for sure. For me. And I, I feel so grateful that... Um, you know, God gave me some skill as a musician, and I have been able to use that gift for for churches, for in, in His kingdom, and and to do things that I felt like were pro faith. You know what I mean? Um, and that was a huge part of why I even went to church because I think it was probably around sixth grade. Our our church organist, which I don't know that we even had an organ then; it was probably piano by then, but um, asked me to play drums at a service once a month. And I don't know that I really cared about the service, but I love playing the drums. And so um, I said, absolutely, I'll do that. And this this church organist was a smart lady. Uh, she knew that uh, little Robbie Pesky couldn't drive himself to church in sixth grade. And so um, if Robbie Pesky showed up, uh, Bubba Pesky, who is an amazing singer and guitar player and musician. Um, he might just have to come too. Well, he's there. You know, he might as well grab his guitar. And so I don't know that they even wanted me to play the drums, but they knew if Rob said he'd be there that Bob would show up too. And um which led to him, you know, being a worship leader for, I don't know how long he's been doing that now, 30, 40 years? Um, long time. Um, and so it's just interesting how all those things kind of weave together and how they, you know, when I was 12 years old, I wasn't thinking about being a pastor or being part of a church in general. I just wanted to play the drums and fast forward 30 years, here I am playing the drums, working as a pastor with a lot of the same people in this church that is clearly an offshoot of what we were doing back then, even in the 90s, you know, can you imagine? So you actually had some connections or networks of people way back then that are still in your, almost like a network still to this day. Oh, absolutely. And and those were the, you know, was it a sermon or a Bible study or something that got me? I don't know. Um, I mean, I certainly learned things and heard things at church that I think led to me becoming a Christian, but it was really um, Pastor Randy, who wasn't even a pastor at the time. He was a youth pastor. Uh, I had, there was a, a dear friend of mine in high school. Her name is, her name now is Katie Rook. She was Katie Rosfett at the time, um, that uh, she was one of these friends that wouldn't accept anything less than a commitment. Like, if you're going to say you're a Christian, you're going to have to walk the walk. And I remember her giving me a book and almost saying, like, we're not going to be friends till you read this. And uh, like, oh, you know, but uh, I read it and I believed it and I wanted to be friends with her. And we were, we're still friends to this day. You know, she's moved off and has her own life and her own family. And um, But I'm forever grateful for this redheaded junior in high school that said, Hey, if you're going to say you are a Christian, then you got to start acting like it. You got to look like it. And uh, I thought that that was, that was huge for me. Um, and I carried that with me as I went off to college and I went to the University of Mary, right? Again, here in Bismarck, North Dakota, you know. Didn't want to change. Yeah, I had like the, the, the address labels, you know, for all my graduation cards. I didn't want to change that. So I did live on campus. So technically, that's a different zip code, but my permanent address. It was still 58503, just like it is today. Um, but yeah, you know, you go to college and you make new friends. And um, I had my second year, I was in the music major apartment, which, you know, was, I think it was six guys, maybe it was five of us um, that were all music majors. And that was kind of what brought us together. But um, it, they were good guys. Uh, one of them is a priest now, um, Catholic guy. Um, Two of them that come to mind, they're not um, like pastors or anything, but they're still very active in their churches. In fact, um, one of them, Mark Harold, hate to name drop, uh, he plays at church here. I mean, he's a great guy and a great community member, and he's still like a, one of my best friends. Uh, and then the other one that comes to mind right away is Andrew Weichsel, who I think he goes to Century Baptist, but another great like spiritual friend who uh, we'd talk about faith. And I remember many nights, all of us sitting around the sink by the bathroom. I don't know why that was where we gathered. <laughs> but, 
but uh, having these theological discussions. And um, frankly, all four of us in the story still are going in different directions in terms of faith. If you want to get, you know, there's a Catholic and a Baptist and uh, Mark comes to church with us, but also goes to another church and, you know, but we could all support each other. And I, I like to think I was influencing them at the time too. I mean, it was just, but again, we didn't think of it as a church or a small group or a network or anything. It was just the guys who lived in the apartment. Yeah. It was just authentic and natural and, you know, this podcast is about dare to care and stuff like that. But I think I experienced that just naturally in my life. It was probably dare to care back then, but it just didn't have the name. Right. We didn't have the name yet. And, uh, and that's what brought me to faith. And I think that's why we're doing all of this dare to care stuff here is we're trying to recreate those experiences for people in ways that are authentic and natural. But whenever you try to recreate it, you sort of, you've taken away that authenticity thing already. So that's the line I guess we have to walk. Sure. But I, I hear your story and I, for whatever reason, I'm reminded of a year or two ago when your son got confirmed. And it was interesting to me because when he started his talk, how we do things here for confirmation at Inspire is we have all of our high schoolers speak in front of the church. And he started by kind of apologizing for not having a like a spectacular changing moment yeah um but when i hear his story and when i hear your story like the perfect christian life or or like the idealized christian life shouldn't require tragedy for you to be saved you know it's it's so wonderful to hear a story where you grew up in the church and at some point you found your own faith in that yeah well, and yeah, I remember when Ben, my son, was giving that testimony and he said that. I, in my head, I went, yeah, you're welcome. You know, like, good parenting right there, you know, which the moment I do that, my, my own father smacks me upside the head and said, yeah, you're welcome. And uh, Just passing it on down. Well, it is. And I think as parents, we all want to pass on that life. But I do remember kind of struggling in my life because, you know, you go to a, a church service or maybe a worship event, even the fire that I talked about earlier, we'd have these guest speakers come in and they'd always have these amazing um, conversion stories. You know, I was a drug addict and I hit rock bottom and Christ came and saved me. Or, you know, I had this happen in my life and I was just a disaster and all of a sudden I found Jesus and my whole life changed. And I don't remember my whole life changing. I mean, I remember little baby steps along the way. Um but like I said, I was at church every Sunday. You know, I don't remember a Sunday when I wasn't there unless we were out of town or something like that. Um, and you don't need to have a tragedy to find your way to Jesus. Like, praise God you don't. <laughs> a lot of us have had lives that were pretty comfortable and easy. And, and we found, or I should say, Christ found us there too. Um, and so I think that's important too. Do you have a moment? Not necessarily marred by tragedy but but do you have a moment in your faith journey where you felt really tested or convicted yeah for or against Jesus by any means or I remember when I felt like I believed I was again middle school probably and there were two confirmation classes and in my brain they were like back to back weeks I don't know if that's true but that's how I remember it and uh my pastor at the time pastor Bob Nordvall who's still around in the community did a lesson where he drew a line across a marker board and he drew all these tributaries and it was a river and it was all these scripture from the Old Testament that talked about Jesus and what he would do and how he would come and it all fed into this main thing and then at the end of this tributary was Jesus and I remember sitting through that class and at the end of the class going that makes sense I believe that like it it, like I got it okay and then, like I said, a little visual, Rob. Right. Well, the visual, I can still see it. I'm, I'm a visual person. I can still see it on the board. And I, I wish I, you know, this was before cell phones, if you can imagine that. I wish I could have taken a picture of it because it really was a, a very well thought out lesson. But it made sense. It was a very intellectual understanding of it. And I felt like, okay, that makes sense. And then the next week or whenever it happened, I remember Randy, who again was still a youth pastor, he did a thing where he took uh, a kid named Josh, and I remember his last name, but I won't say it just in case he's embarrassed by this, but 
but Josh was the coolest, most popular guy I had ever met. Like he was, I think he was a high school student. He was the star of the basketball team. He was tall. He was handsome. He was fit. He was like, wow. And here is little Robbie Pesky, who's like an awkward seventh grader who is the wrong size and shape and can't bounce a ball to save his life. But anyway, Randy had Josh get up and he had to hold two books out at his side with his arms straight out. So it's kind of like he made a cross, but he's holding these books at the end. And I don't know what Randy talked about, but he just made Josh stand there. And of course, eventually Josh couldn't hold it up anymore. His arms collapsed. And and every time he did, Randy would come over and put his arms back up and make him do it. And, you know, he's sitting there shaking and sweating and finally collapsed. And the point of the lesson that Randy was giving was we, none of us are good enough to hold up our faith on our own, that we all fall short and we all sin and even and in my head my little middle school brain i saw like the coolest greatest guy i'd ever seen in real life fall apart in this class and i thought well gosh if if josh can't do it there's no way i can do it and i think that was the the emotional for lack of a better word like the feeling of belief came to me in that time Um, and so those are the two moments that i think of as like holy cow this is this is the real deal. And that's when I really feel like I started to believe. And certainly I've grown since then. I've learned more and I've had more conversion experiences throughout my life because I think we all forget. We'll have moments where it's like, oh shoot, I am not acting like I believe in a savior. I'm not acting like a person who's saved. I'm trying to save myself here. And uh, so I think I'm re, re-saved. I don't know. Is that a thing? over and over and over throughout my life. But those are the two moments that I felt like were the turning moments for me growing up. Sure. On, on the topic of you caring for others, at least from what I know about your story, tell us how was your faith shaped or how did your faith shape life with your daughter? Yeah. Well, and when you asked the last question about was there a really difficult time, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, um, man, I don't even know what year it was. I suppose it was 2014 because we just had the 10-year anniversary. In in 2014, my wife and I adopted our daughter, Emily. Uh, she was in an orphanage in Bulgaria, and she was about two and a half years old when we adopted her and brought her back here. And I have to tell you, that was, and, and maybe even continues to be the hardest experience of my life. Um being in a foreign country with a child who doesn't understand what you're saying and has special needs. And we don't even know what the special needs are. Um, and I think about as hard as that was for me, like how absolutely terrifying that must've been to her. These two people showed up one day and said, Hey, you're coming with us and flew her halfway across the world and said, Oh, by the way, you've got two older brothers now. And I mean, just all of it. I mean, it's just overwhelming. Um, and I remember being so stressed out. I couldn't eat. I think, I think for two days in Bulgaria, I didn't eat because I just, I I had no appetite because we didn't know if she was going to survive the plane flight home, much less what this means for our life and our family and all these things we had built. It was, it's easily the most stressful time in my life that I can remember was that week we spent with her in country doing all the paperwork to get her to come back with us. And, um, I kind of laugh at myself now because a big part of why we did this, especially for my wife, she felt God was calling her to do it. Like that there's this child out there that needs you and uh, is supposed to be part of your family and you need to go get her. Like that. And how arrogant of me to think that if God called me to do it, like I have to do all of these things. Like I need to make sure this is right. But we all go through that and we all have these things. But I remember... I was probably even years later looking back because anyone who knows Emily now, she is a completely different kid than she was all those years ago. Um, I mean, they told us she would never speak. She could hardly walk. I mean, it was, she couldn't eat solid foods. She was a mess. And you know, now it's getting her to stop talking is kind of a challenge. Um, she's a great dancer and she eats constantly. I mean, all of these things that we were just terrified of then, we don't even think about now, you know, there's new challenges, but they're, it's different. And you can just see the hand of God. Like he had to have been just laughing at me in Bulgaria. Like, Oh, you idiot. (laughs) You think I'm going to call you all the way around the world and then not take care of this little girl? Like, come on. And, And so every story that I think of when you talk about 
my life in faith, because that's basically what we're talking about here. I mean, there's more to my life than the faith, but um, it's always about the people in the story, right? The adoption story isn't about any of the paperwork. I didn't tell you about any of the sites we saw in Bulgaria. I talk about the little girl that was there, and I talk about my wife, who I have basically not talked about at all, but you want to talk about like an influential person in your life, in your faith, and in your family. And I talk about the people that told me stories as a kid who brought me to faith. And um, I mentioned one or two sermons in there, right? But really, the reason those sermons worked was the relationship I had with the people in the sermon. You know, if I didn't know anything about Josh, Randy's whole thing would have meant nothing to me. Like, who is this guy holding books out? It doesn't matter, you know? Um, And so when I think about my life and Dare to Care, I think that's, we're trying to present opportunities for people. Randy says this a lot. He says, to belong into believing, where we belong to this group of people. You know, I belong to that group of music majors in that dorm room all those years ago. And because I felt safe and connected to those people, it was really easy for me to have conversations with them about faith and life and all of those things, even when we don't agree. I mean, this friend of mine who's now a priest, we're still friends. Like we hang out, we visit, and we don't agree on everything in faith, but the relationship is solid enough that we can actually have discussions. And I think both of us grow more confident and more connected to our faith in those conversations, even if it's not the exact same faith, <laughs> you know, if it's not the same direction, but but it's been good like that. And and I think, you know, for me personally, that's a big reason why I wanted to become a pastor at all is I feel like God has just gift wrapped this life for me. You know, he's surrounded me. He, 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 he brought me into a family of good Christian folks that took me to church and brought me to the church. And he put people like Pastor Randy and these roommates and my wife and all of these different people that just led me to Christ when I needed to be led to him. And uh, I, I feel like I've had an enchanted life. Like it's just all worked out. And how can I not then try at least to give some of that back to the community of faith and, and to offer those same questions and those same discussions and that same community to others as much as I can um, to help them find, oh, find themselves in a place where Christ can grab a hold of them like he grabbed a hold of me. So I was just reading in Luke, the book of Luke the other day, um, the story about seed being scattered and um, how sometimes it falls on the rocky places where there's no soil and it can't be grown. And I think it says the birds snatch it up. And other times they're scattered uh, in amongst thorns and bushes and stuff like that, and it gets choked out. And then sometimes it falls on good soil where it can actually grow and yield fruit. And I feel like, Ministry, which is all Dare to Care is, it's just the ministry of at Inspire, exists to help clear away some of those bushes and thorns and brambles and, and give these seeds that God is planting a space to grow. And so that's what I'm trying to do with my work at Inspire. Um, that's what I've been trying to do throughout my whole life as best I can. And I think that's what Dare to Care, that's what we hope Dare to Care will do for people, is clear space where God's word has a, pl- a chance to be planted and to grow and to yield its fruit a hundredfold. And I think Rob's been a huge blessing to the Dare to Care ministry, just launching it because it was a great idea with Pastor Ernie and Pastor Randy. They're busy. Yeah. So then um, when I've kind of, you know, passed on some of the youth and kids ministry to Kate, I knew what I was doing in kids and ministry, you know, youth, because I was a teacher. Well, then I was like, you know what, this Dare to Care, I love community and I love connections. Let me take this on. But I will say there's thorns that keep me back because I get, don't like to talk in front of people and I get nervous and I like to do behind the scenes. Well, then Rob's my, he's my push. He's like, nope, we're doing this. So Rob's been a blessing to kind of launch Dare to Care and really get this going. And he's always been up there on stage or by my side to just kind of make sure that the, the logistics and all the things are keep, they keep running. And so I would say Rob definitely is a huge blessing for. Oh, shucks. Thanks. Well, and. He cares. <laughs> I do. I do care. And. What's been happy for me is, uh, Carol, your heart for this, like your heart for people is very obvious. I mean, if anyone ever has a conversation with Carol and by the end of it, you feel like, hmm, I don't think she really cared. 
you you have found the wrong person. That wasn't Carol. That was somebody else. You you she's in the other room or something like that. Right, right. No, she would love to talk to you all day long in a coffee shop, but put a mic in front of her and she gets nervous and stuff like that. So, but but that's what Dare to Care is about. You don't have to be Pastor Rob and you don't have to be Carol or Ty. You don't have to be up on stage to do this ministry. You just have to love the people God puts in your path. That's like Josh in your youth group. Just like Josh. Didn't even probably doesn't even remember me or know, but what an impact he had on me and my whole life. And um, I think I think you, the listeners, can have that impact too. And you might not ever ever know it. You may never, never know um, what God is doing through you. But if you give him the chance, he will work through you. So thank you, Rob. I I'm sure this isn't the last time we'll hear from you or your story. Um but thank you for sharing, and, and I just want to, before we're done, just just bless you and, and pray for you, and, and thank you for, for all the things that you do here. So um, if you guys are listening to this and driving, we always say, don't close your eyes. No, no, but, keep our eyes on the road. <laughs> but we're going to pray here. Father, thank you for Pastor Rob, um, a man I've known for, for many years now and, and who continues to just bless not just me, but the people around me and the church with just such a caring heart and continuing to live in a way that is evident of great faith and the way that you work through people here. Um, continue to bless his seminary journey, continue to bless his family and, and the, the things that he does uh, in active ministry here at this church. It's in your mighty name that we pray. Amen. Amen. So if you guys have any comments, if you connected with Rob's story and, and you want to connect even further, Rob, is it just Rob, or is it Rob.Pesky? I'm Rob.Pesky at Inspire Family. So that's P-E-S-K-E, Rob.Pesky at InspireFamily.org. If you have other comments or, or questions about Dare to Care in general, you can email Carol. That's Carol with an E at InspireFamily.org. Uh, going forward, you'll hear more stories like this, more personal stories, more stuff where we're just talking about the ministry that we have here and, and the people that are a part of it. So stay tuned. We'd love to see you back here soon. We also invite you to join us in person again at Inspire any Sunday or Wednesday that you're able. 523 North 21st Street, Bismarck, North Dakota, Sunday 915 and 1045, Wednesday nights at 7. Thank you guys very much for listening. Hope to see you soon.